everyone welcome back to the channel welcome back to another video today we've got a very very special guest uh, he's just next to me as you can you guys can see Isaac I will let him do the introductions and uh, or I should just let you guys know that we will uh, talk about uh, his experience as a student here in the UK uh, his perspectives in terms of uh, future, also you know basically his journey, what he's, he's been through uh, throughout the years that he's been here in the UK, and and this is a new series in terms of interviewing. Isaac is the first one, and uh, I I think we feel very lucky to to have him, so I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, so Isaac, again, thank you. Aladi, thank you so much for having me on your platform. Um, I always enjoy discussing things with you. I feel like we bounce ideas very well off each other. And to everyone watching, hello to you all and good day. My name is Isaac. I am from Zimbabwe and I am a recent legal practice course and masters, aka LPC and LLM graduate from the University of Law here in London. I started my legal journey and my journey in the UK in 2016, so about four years ago, uh, where I came to do a foundation, first at Coventry University. The foundation was six months long. Um, it was very challenging, especially because it was my first time actually living in another country, um, having grown up in Zimbabwe. Uh, but you know, I got through it and after that I did my LLB, my Bachelor of Laws at Royal Holloway University of London. Um, I managed to get through that. I did really well. I got a 2-1 degree, um, which, you know, <laughs> it took a lot of hard work, but at the end of the day, we got over the hurdles. Um, and that led to the point I am now. Um, I started my master's at the University of Law in January this year. Amongst all of this COVID um, confusion and, you know, difficult situation that we're all facing, um, but I managed to get through that very well, and I will be graduating with a distinction. Wow, that's that's. I mean, it's uh, for the for everyone watching. Uh, there's a special reason why uh, Isaac is our first one. Is really, uh, as you as he just said, is really someone special, and I think we can all learn from his experience and and also share it to whoever is watching and is uh, interested. So. Uh, basically, uh, you know, it's what we lately been talking about is just uh, I wanted to know how it's been for you as an African uh, student coming to the UK because we all have these ideas of what is the UK, what is London, probably maybe you've been here before or not. So how was it then to be here and actually living and studying here from an from a African perspective and, and, and being here in London? Like you say, I've actually been to the UK, London in particular, a few times um, with family, but it was mainly for holidays, vacations, and it would be for a maximum of, you know, a week to two weeks. Mm. But, you know, having grown up and being born and raised in Zimbabwe, going to primary and secondary school, boarding school in Zimbabwe, I was very used to um, a comforting and supportive environment. You know, growing up in boarding schools, they don't just, you know, throw you into the furnace. You know, they want to mold you and grad gradually foster you into, you know, the man that, you know, you want to become. Yes. So, growing up in that environment and then coming to London, um, <laughs> London town, you know, notorious for many diff um, different things that I won't get into now. Absolutely. It was a very big change to me. I, I mean, I'll use an example, you know, you could be walking down in London, you can't really stop anyone and say, look, I'm lost, can you, can you show me where to go? People are always on the go in London, they have their That's headphones true. in, um, their heads down. So, in terms of that, it was, it was a shock, it was definitely a culture shock. But at the same time, it was an experience that I needed. It has given me the exposure that I feel every individual should have, but I know we're not all fortunate enough to be able to be afforded that opportunity. Absolutely. I've learned a lot. I have met people from all over the world. Um, mm. London is very culturally um, diverse. Absolutely. So, you know, in that sense, it's been amazing, but it was a challenge as well. Okay, okay. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, you know, obviously I'm also not from 
London and from yes, the UK. Yes. So it doesn't matter uh, if you studying or working or if you're just coming for an experiment. It, London is really a very uh, uh, special place, but it's also a very it could be very lonely place. Yeah. And, and it's strange in a way that you've got people from everywhere, but uh, at the same time you might feel by yourself. So um, why the UK? Why London? Why was it important for you to, to come to, to this specific city and study? You know, it's a very good question and I was thinking about this quite recently actually. Like I said earlier, having grown up and you know studied my whole life in Zimbabwe, the obvious option for someone in my position for tertiary education would be, look, look at Zimbabwe, especially because I'm a law student, um, it would be better for me to um, study there, get my education in Zimbabwe and already be in a field where you know I'm going to practice for years. Mm. Um, that was the obvious um, option that I had. My other option was to go to South Africa where, you know, um, because of proximity, it's really close to Zimbabwe and I also have some family in South Africa. I thought, you know, they have outstanding universities there. Absolutely. That's another option for me to explore. But I had a chat with my father when I was at home and he said, look, you're in a position where you have a chance to, you know, get exposure, different countries, different continents, you know. Yeah. So if you can get in there, why not go for it? And he asked, if you had that option, where would you go? first thing that came to my mind was London. If you ask me for an exact reason why, I do not know, mm -hmm. but now I can testify that all the experiences, the challenges, the difficulties I've gone through while I was here, mm -hmm. just explain to me why this was the right place for me. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. I mean, again, London is still one of the most uh, searched places to study in terms of education. We all know uh, uh, the English education system is one of the best Oh, yeah. uh, in the world and you the proof of it so yeah and uh, so now being here in London and already uh, settled and let's say you are in your second year what were the first things that you really felt that you had a completely different perception and then when you started dealing with the reality it was something completely different Another very good question, and the first one will sound a little bit funny, but I'm sure you can appreciate it was the weather. Ah. <laughs> I got here, um, you know, not used to such extreme colds, and you know, summer here is at best 20 something um, degrees Celsius, and where I come from, that, that's winter practically, so <laughs> it was a very big shock for me. Um, as well as like I say, it's a very um, culturally diverse place, but you know, meeting people with completely different values to mm -hmm. what I am used to. Um, yes. You know, going to university, I always greeted my lecturers, mm -hmm. "Good morning, sir. Good afternoon, madam," yes. um, because this is how I was raised. Yes. But you know, the people around me were not bothered about small things like that, and mm -hmm. to me, I first didn't understand how people could be like this where they're not taught to respect their elders um, but I realized it's just a part of their their way of life and mm -hmm. every place is different every individual is different so I rather than being judgmental I took a step back and said look I'm going to appreciate why people do what they do here and just learn from it absolutely absolutely I mean, yeah, that's another excellent uh, answer yes is and the weather it is what it is we know <laughs> Uh, I don't know if you've been to, to the UK or to London in, in particular, but it, it, you have the four different seasons in one day. So <laughs> you don't know what to wear, you don't know, it's just one of those things. But yeah, yeah I mean, now uh, after four years and with all this distinction that you, you know, uh, uh, you really did well in terms of you applied the, the best of your knowledge and you really uh, gave your best in terms of getting the best results. So I, I I have to say that it's good that you had the opportunity to come, but it's also even better that you really you know you you applied hard to get the results. Because there's a lot of people that get the opportunity, but eventually you know they don't you know they don't do the as well or they play or they do other things. But I, I'm really happy that you did focus and carry on into your objectives so now you've done that right so now we actually looking 
into the future, right? So it's all about the future right now. Yeah. So what are your future perspectives? Uh, uh, do they include Europe, UK in particular? Do they include Africa, Zimbabwe in particular? Where do you see yourself? So what is the future looking like for you? So one of my favorite psychologists and lecturers, Jordan Peterson, we have had many um, conversations about him. I'm not, I'm not sure if um, um, all of you or any of you have heard of him, but uh, I would say and I would really recommend his work and his lectures. Uh, some of them are as short as 10 minutes, but yes. you, know, you know what I'm talking about. Anyways, Jordan Peterson says this, you must always develop a vision. Once you have a vision, you develop a strategy and then you start working towards it. So this is something that, although I came across him recently, I realized that this is something that's really important for any of us to have, no matter what our goals or ambitions or career paths are. So at the moment, um, I have realized what my vision is and I have created a strategy. Obviously, because of um, the circumstances we are in, mm -hmm. a lot of things have been slowed down and I'll get into that in a moment. Yeah. Um, it's been a difficult time. So having completed my legal practice course and master's here, the next obvious and immediate step would be for me to get what they call a training contract. I'm sure some of you know what that is. Mm -hmm. It's basically a graduate job where two years, um, where you have two years of training. And after that, you would then qualify as a newly qualified solicitor. And basically from there, you can you know, start your own practice. Mm -hmm. So that is what I intend to do um, next. Mm -hmm. But because of the current difficult economic climate, um, it has been harder to secure that training contract, um, so to secure a job. Um, I'm applying, I literally ap apply every day because, you know, if you have a goal, you've got to work um, towards it bit Absolutely. by bit every day. Absolutely. You don't have to, you know, do crazy things every day or crazy amounts of work. But if you work towards it bit by bit, things will, you know, the circle will align. Absolutely. So that is my immediate plan. Once I have done that, like I said, strategy uh, and a vision, um, I want to become a lawyer and I want to practice in Zimbabwe in the long run. Once I've done that, um, I would have gained the experience I need, the training I need here in the UK. Mm -hmm. Hopefully stay with the firm that I get my training contract with for another five years, um, mm -hmm. for example, and then return home with my expertise and the knowledge, the exposure that I've been given and do something big for my country. Absolutely. So for you, it's all, uh, it's, it's important to, uh, if you do have the opportunity, it's important to uh, get the best from the place you've studied, get yes. the best in terms of uh, not only uh, 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 the education, but also the work experience. That's yes. the way you say it. Yes, right? that, that you've said it very, very well. I didn't say it that clearly, but yeah. <laughs> that's the point I was getting yeah, to. Absolutely. So um, now, and obviously, we, we all know we're living under this, you know, COVID-19 and all this, uh, 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 you know, the world uh, just shifted. This is completely yeah. different. The dynamics has changed and, and people had different ideas. They were thinking about so many, you know, projects, so many ideas, so many different things. And all of it is now uh, uh, stranded, cancelled, whatever you want to call it. Um, what was the, the the number one thing that you would have changed if you could? I would say in the past, let's say two years, one year and a half, as you were looking to the to finish your studies, what were the were there if there was something were there something that you would change, uh, 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 or you find yourself in the circumstances that you would like to? Perhaps. The one thing that you know that I think about quite a lot is um, for my LLB degree, um, my bachelor's, I got a 2-1. So a 2-1 is not the best, but it's the second best. So it's a second class degree. Um, I was very capable of getting a first, but you know, I've been emphasizing this point of um, exposure and you know, learning about people, about the place you're in. And mm -hmm. one of the ways I did that um, while I was doing my LLB was you know, doing quite a lot of traveling, um, meeting people, um, you know, enjoying you know, going out with people, like doing what I could here that I could um, didn't have the opportunity to do back home. Absolutely. Exposure comes back to that. So obviously that was sort of detrimental to the grades I got. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not saying, you know, if I hadn't gone out, I would have got it first, but I'm saying it would have allowed me more time um, 
to focus on my studies and that way I could have done a little bit better mm -hmm. but overall I don't think there's much I would change because you know we live and learn and I feel mm. that that's very important we go through certain things so that you know later we can look back and say okay maybe if I had done this but you you now have that lesson you have now learned something you know and you can pass it down to you know people younger than you or to anyone really mm -hmm. absolutely uh, uh, so four years in right what would you advise whoever is watching uh, uh, from wherever they are in terms of um, planning? Was planning something important for you? How did you plan to come? Did everything happen the way that you, you, you planned or how, how was that part of the, that experience? Wow, planning, you know. They say uh, we plan and God loves because some of the times we have um, an idea that we think, you know, this is the right thing and this is the only way to mm. achieve it. Yes. But circumstances hit us, COVID being a primary example, very That's topical cool. at the moment, and cool. our plans just go to dust. I mean, what can we do about that? And I, I'll just share a, an anecdote with you. Um, I grew up in Zimbabwe, and in Zimbabwe, our education system is similar to the UK. So yeah. instead of doing GCEs, um, we do IGCSE, you know, international GCSEs, basically. And, um, you know, I did that uh, when I was 16, and then I had to do my A-levels. I did it from Zimbabwe as well. Mm -hmm. And my predictions were A-star AA for my A-levels. And with those grades, I was automatically going to be going to um, the universities of my choice because that was a requirement. Yeah. Now, exam time came. I did my A-levels. I didn't do as well as I should have. I was not going to be able to actually get into any law school in the UK mm -hmm. um, with, the, with the grades I got. And that's the reason why I actually ended up going um, to Coventry for that six month foundation. Mm -hmm. Six months because it was accelerated, but after that I actually ended up getting A star AA, the equivalent of that. Mm -hmm. And I was then able to proceed with my plans. So planning is something that's very difficult because you have to have a tolerance, um, you know, to sort of sidetrack from your plan depending on circumstances. Yeah. And I think that experience that I've just shared just highlighted that to me. So yeah. I understand the importance of planning. It's always necessary to have a plan because without one, you know, you're just aimlessly walking. Um, but once you do have a plan, you must always bear in mind the idea that plans could change. You have to be able to adapt. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I think you're absolutely, absolutely right. Uh, it's all about adapting. Mm -hmm. COVID proved that for, mm -hmm. for, for, the, for this year that is just ending 2020. And uh, well, 100%, you will plan and things will almost never go the way you plan them. There will always be some changes. We all know that. Uh, you know, there's just some surprises in the middle, but yeah, that's the way it is. We always have to also look into planning. Uh, so I completely agree with you. So, what is your take in terms of? Um, we do know that a lot of people want to come here. To he when I say here, I say to Europe, to the to the to the West, right, to study. And I'm talking from the perspective of whoever is outside of the West, right? Yeah. And uh, then when they come here, when they get here, uh, they go through all these challenges that we just spoke about, you know, uh, the adjustment period. And after that, they end up, you know, getting used to w where they are, you know. So you end up being home. You make home where you, where you are. Yes. And then the challenge of going back starts to become a bigger challenge. How do you see this? Is uh, have you thought about it, or do you think no? I I'll do what I have to do. I'll do my experience, and after my experience, I'm definitely sure I will be going back home. You see, with this question, I believe that different people would have a different answer and a different outlook on it. And um, here is mine. I have the long-term goal, um, like I've said to you, and like I've said earlier on of going back home to you know make a difference for my country mm -hmm. that that is my long-term plan yeah. and I do appreciate the fact that you know the West um, as you've described it and to find it is completely different um, from Africa mm -hmm. you know the problems that we have in Africa aren't even thought of here and I'll use um, one that really 
gets to me uh, when I'm in Zimbabwe, it's electricity. Um, a lot of us now are trying to go off grid because we know that the you know power providers are not efficient and yeah. they we don't get what we deserve. I mean, you could go a week or weeks even without electricity. There are water issues as well. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, these may sound like such small or maybe even trivial examples, but yeah. these are things that people end up thinking about where they say, okay, look, yeah. I've come here, I said I was going to come here to get exposure, to learn and, you know, get a job, some experience. But now, if I'm going back home, I'm regressing rather than progressing. And I, mm. I can completely understand that. But the only way our continents or developing countries could get better is if we, the people who have had this opportunity and made the most of that opportunity, come mm. out here, we get our experience, and then we take it back home. Because at the moment, how I see it, I, I'm sure um, I don't have the statistics, statistics on this, um, but we are losing more people to mm -hmm. the West, mm -hmm. which is already developed, and no one is coming home. And that's why we are so far behind. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So how do you see um, Zimbabwe in the next, let's say, uh, 10 years? Because uh, from what you've said, that should be the period where you should be going back home. I don't know if you follow up the news or, or you know, uh, how do you see uh, things going back home? I'm quite up to date with the news um, in Zimbabwe in particular. Um, probably not as much or not so with the rest of Africa, but in my own country, I feel that things will improve in the next um, 10 years. But improvement is a very relative um, term in the mm -hmm. sense that, you know, for someone improving would mean, you know, we see skyscrapers and, you know, I don't know, flying cars, just for lack of a better example, it, it, within those 10 years. But for a country like ours, an improvement would be, you know, now we can rely on our power providers. We, we no longer have power cuts. Now our roads are being maintained. We no longer have potholes everywhere. We now have more highways. Our traffic lights are working. That is actually improvement. And to us, that will be a big thing to the Zimbabwean people. Having a stable currency, you know, something like that would be improvement. But to others, they'd be like, okay, you've improved like this, but you're still about 100 years behind, you know, first world countries. Mm -hmm. So how can you say that's improvement? I say it is improvement because for us, we haven't had that yet. You know, we're yet to experience those luxuries. To an, to an extent that they become things that we don't think about. We're yet to get there. Absolutely. I completely, you know, 100% uh, support what you said. Because uh, I, um, you know, I also think about the same thing. Uh, uh, we do have uh, struggles, uh, our own struggles in, in, in Guinea-Bissau, mm -hmm. as you know. And it's basically what you just said. It's all about uh, infrastructures, lack of this, lack mm -hmm. of that. and. It really takes uh, people going back home, yeah. and it really yeah. takes about uh, uh, people taking their expertise, their experiences, and really wanting to face the challenges in yes. order to actually uh, start a change. So I, I completely agree with you. Uh, it's all about baby steps, isn't it? Yes. What is yes. small for us, it, it, or what is small for others, is massive for it's us, isn't it? So Perfect. absolutely, Perfect. yeah. I, I mean, uh, and, and again, it, it's I'm I'm always looking things in, in these two different perspectives. You know, uh, the West and the other countries. In in this particular case, uh, in our case, is Africa. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, um, was was there any uh, situation that uh, uh, you felt like, oh, okay, this. There was a surprise in terms of how people reacted by your either your 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 capacities, you know, your skills, or you know, just from the standpoint of not being a Westerner. Did you had any of those challenges? School wise, I mean. You know, the example that springs to mind before I touch on the school topic is you know graduate jobs. These training contracts that I've been mentioning. Um, there's a question um, in the application process that they always ask, um, do you need permission to study in the UK? Which basically means, uh, do you need visa sponsorship? Are you a foreigner or not? <laughs> right. So that question, I, I don't know how true this is, but I've heard and I 
quite strongly believe that there's a filtering system. Once you say yes to that question, you're already on, mm -hmm. on the back foot, you know. Mm -hmm. This is not to say that people who are um, EU citizens or British citizens mm -hmm. um, are not affected or, you know, they, they, they aren't... Um, this is not to say that because they're British students, um, they have a better chance of that. No, yeah. I'm not taking away any credi credibility from them. It's just saying, you know, little things like that make us feel, at least, that we're on the back foot. And that, that, that's a little bit difficult. In terms of school, um, you know, I, I think I'm quite uh, privileged in, in the sense of the school that I went to. I didn't really encounter um, any of those difficulties or differences based on where I'm from. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know why that was, but, you know, I, I can't really speak on that topic because I didn't experience it. And mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to share anything that, you know, wouldn't be relevant. Absolutely, absolutely. That's also, I would say, uh, without never uh, st uh, uh, studying in, 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 in the UK or in London, Specifically, but I would say that that's one of the advantages of being maybe in London, which is so multicultural. Yes. People from everywhere, and there's an you know open mind to to everyone and to, to everything. So I I say that especially in the in a, you know in a more of a professional area because I I you know I I share and feel the same thing on my working environment, and I yeah. feel like maybe it would be the same thing for. For people that study so um, we already talked about where you see uh, what you think you will see your country yeah. the, the perspective of future improvements if I had to ask you um, uh, to define what's the best for uh, for us in terms of Africa I mean uh, what would you say it is in terms of the best in, in the sense that uh, it's one of those most important things that you think is lacking and, and I don't want to generalize you can obviously take it this specifically to, to Zimbabwe but what is that thing that is missing the most one of the most important things in your case speaking on Africa as a continent, I would say the first um, issue is a lack of unity. Now, mm -hmm. what I basically mean by that, um, I know we all probably have our own um, definitions of what unity actually is, but we look at something like the European Union um, and we want to transpose that onto an, an African perspective. Um, I've never heard of an African Union that has been as successful as the unions here. Yes, we could say that's because we're behind and we're still developing countries, but it comes down to governance, in my opinion. And, you know, I'm not, I, I don't want to speak on this as, you know, I've never been in a position of responsibility, responsibility such as that, mm -hmm. but the lack of unity in our continent is holding us back, first point. Second is integrity. And that's automatically linked to corruption. Mm -hmm. Yes, I understand there are so many things that were like, you know, put onto us that we, you know, we can't really creep out of mm -hmm. anymore, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's been difficult on our leaders, but we see this. I mean, you can pick any random African country right now. There will be some form of corruption, um, you know, in their regimes. This is not to say there's no corruption in the West. No, yeah, absolutely. because there is, but it's, I would say, probably better concealed and it's never at the expense of the general public. So it's never at the expense of the people. But in Africa, it always is, you know. And if we could, you know, start working on those two aspects, um, unity and integrity um, slash corruption, I think we'd see improvements in the continent as a whole. Because once we start um, working together, you know, you've heard of the Cape to Cairo um, you know, mm -hmm. railway that was supposed to be built. Yes. Something like that would make um, trade so much smoother, trade so much easier between so many countries in Africa because, you know, Cape Town is right at the bottom, Cairo is right at the top. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's things like that that we need to improve on, mm -hmm. in my opinion. And, and what's your... Uh, is... And I think we kind of uh, 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 talk about it, but do you believe in the future of Africa in terms of do you believe by the time you have children 
uh, uh, or in the, in the next few years, things will eventually get better and eventually uh, people will start uh, deciding to study back home instead of coming to the West. Uh, nothing against coming to, to the West, obviously, for the obvious reasons, but what, how do you see the future uh, uh, of Africa, particularly in, in, in of Zimbabwe? I believe in Africa. I believe in our people. I believe in our minerals and I believe in the direction we're going in. Like I said, it, it's probably going to take us a lot of time to be what um, the world sees as, you know, a great continent. Uh, but I feel like we are slowly um, and we are pointed in the right direction. Coming closer to home and talking about Zimbabwe briefly, um, we were once called the breadbasket of Africa. You know, yes. we were an agrarian economy, you know, our agriculture was booming, we had our minerals, we had the platinum, we had gold. Um, and, you know, due to corruption, um, a topic I briefly touched on earlier, things just went to waste and, you know, our minerals are being exploited at the moment, but we're getting to a point where things are getting better. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, yes, I believe in the future of Africa and I believe that, or and I hope as well, um, by the time, you know, I can start raising my family and permanently move back home, things will be better. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, I think we, we, this could be a conversation for hours, <laughs> isn't it? And uh, I, it's just amazing to have the chance to really uh, speak to you, uh, a young man like yourself and so uh, interested in really, you know, uh, all these different topics. And I really want to thank you. So uh, it, it's time for me to say Wahita. 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 Okay. Uh, Isaac. Yeah, yeah. Wahita Isaac. Actually, yeah, you did it. <laughs> Wahita Isaac. Did you learn that? Uh, yeah, I, I planned this. Wahita means if I'm not, if I didn't mess it up, Wahita means thank you. Yeah. So just to quickly, briefly correct you, Wahita means like you've done it. But you can also translate okay, it. Thank no, no, okay, so I'm, what I meant was you've done it. What I meant was you've done it. You've done it. I got the so, message. You're surprised. Yeah, I mean, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. I wish you nothing but the best, and I truly believe that you will have a massive impact, uh, not only in, in in Zimbabwe, but in, in other people's life. Uh, and it's just something you can feel when you see someone with so much potential and really uh, uh, ready to, to give something and to give something back home, you know, never forgetting home. So uh, you were the first one and, and I hope we'll have this chat in a few, in a few years just to see where, from the standpoint well, yeah. of where you will, yeah, exactly where you will be. And I really appreciate the fact that you gave us this opportunity. Thank you for being the first one here with us. Uh, I, on the blog and and fight. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for having thank me. You. Thank really you. Really thank you very much. Thank you, guys. I hope you like uh, this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Please do and support this cause. And again, 